Hello, everybody. How are you today? Good. Before we get started, let's warm up the room a little bit. I'd like to know, raise your hand if you left your house before 10 a.m. to get here. Okay, that's everybody, right? Raise your hand if you left your house before 9 a.m. Okay, all right. So a couple of locals. Raise your hand if you, got he if you left your house be at 8 a.m. or earlier. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay, let's go to 7. Here we go. Here, oh, here we, we have a small number. Is anybody leaving before 6? One person. Okay, so here we, we do have a win. Oh, Todd in the back room. Yes. <laughs> so I thank you all for coming here on a Saturday. Um, good. My name is Dr. Jeannie Garbarino, and I've had the great pleasure of serving as the executive director of Rock EDU Science Outreach. I know some of you, uh, I can see some familiar faces. Some of you are pr probably new to the campus. So welcome back and welcome to those who are new. Um, and I'm so excited that you took time out of a precious Saturday, even some of you waking up before 6 to get here, to join us for Talking Science. This morning, you're going to hear from Rockefeller neuroscientist Brynrich Freiwald, who will talk about the doppelganger in your head. But before I, I introduce Dr. Freiwald, I want to tell you a little bit about Rockefeller University. More than 120 years ago, I don't know, it's so crazy to think about, but there was no internet, there was no cell phones, uh, regular landline phones, does, has anybody ever even used a landline phone? Do you know what I'm talking about with a landline? You know, you, like, you're, you're, like you get stuck, you know? <laughs> That's what that was. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are not familiar with the stuck. Uh, so landlines were just starting to be developed into an accessible technology. The communication was slow, and information was only available to a select few if it was available at all. Around that time, the leading cause of death were infectious diseases, especially in the United States, because most of the sort of understanding that we had about infectious diseases related more so to making somebody feel comfortable as they sort of worked through it, but not necessarily an understanding uh, of what was happening in the disease or an understanding of how to treat that disease. Um, and so because of how little we knew about how diseases spread and could be treated, Everyone was at risk if they were exposed to infectious microbes. This included the beloved young grandson of John D. Rockefeller Sr. His grandson's name was Jock, Jack Rockefeller McCormick. He contracted scarlet fever and died a few months before his fourth birthday. His death was a major blow to Mr. Rockefeller, but it also inspired him to do something meaningful for humanity. In 1901, we broke ground here as he created the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, a dedicated biomedical research institute that quickly became a leader in the fight against disease and in the effort to advance scientific knowledge. In the 1950s, however, Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research expanded what its mission was all about to include doctoral education. And 10 years later, it shifted from be, uh, being called the Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research to the Rockefeller University, because we had students now. But this is not a school for undergraduates, right? We, we don't have students graduating college and then attending school at, you know, for their undergraduate degree. You actually have to get your undergraduate degree here, uh, well, first elsewhere, and then come here. So uh, people come here to earn their PhDs or their MD PhDs. But here's the kicker. How much do you think it costs to get something like that? How much do you think it costs to get an M a PhD or an MD PhD? Yes. Oh, well, we have a lot and we have free, right? <laughs> the answer is not a lot. The answer is actually free. It's zero. It's not free for the university, but it is free for the student, right? So as an FYI, if you are interested in a career path and you're worried about loans, PhD or MD PhD is an excellent path to consider, especially if you love STEM or scientific research. So here, there are approximately 250 graduate students on campus each year, and they, um, and they work with 600 scientists who range from postdoctoral fellows. So these are people who've already gotten their PhD and they're continuing their specialization. Um, to dis the distinguished professors like Vinrick, who head the university's more than 70 laboratories. Our mission has always been science for the benefit of humanity. 
Rockefeller scientists conduct basic and clinical research. So basic research is understanding like what's happening for the sake of science, whereas clinical research deals a lot more with how we can understand medicines and other things that treat human diseases. <clears throat> and the investigations of Rockefeller scientists touch on almost every disease or health condition you can think of. Some of the many accomplishments and breakthroughs of Rockefeller scientists are listed on the back of your program. Over the years, the importance of the discoveries made at Rockefeller has been recognized throughout the world. In fact, 26 Rockefeller scientists have been awarded the Nobel Prize, including two who have received their awards in the last seven years. Yeah, it's cool, right? Sometimes you get in an elevator and you're like, oh my god, that guy has a Nobel Prize. Um, but the university does more than co conduct great science. We believe that Rockefeller's mission also includes sharing our science with students and teachers like yourselves. In fact, Rock EDU Science Outreach works year-round to provide fun, authentic science experiences to thousands of students across this city and beyond. Our activities include form informal gatherings and mentored research programs such as Lab Jumpstart and the Summer Science Research Program. For those of you who might have applied to either of them, feel free to say hello to me. Um, and you can find out more about these programs and other sci science learning activities on our Rock EDU website www.rockefeller.edu forward slash outreach. We are deeply grateful to the Andrea C. Dracopoulos Family Science and Society Initiative and Bristol, Bristol Myers Squibb for providing the generous support that enables us to present this year's exciting Talking Science program. Okay, <clears throat> I'm done with my spiel. Now it's time to introduce the speaker. It is my pleasure to bring up Dr. Vinrick Frywall. Vinrick is the Denise A. and Eugene W. Chinnery Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Neural Systems here at Rockefeller. A renowned neuroscientist, Vinrick is working to understand how the brain uses visual information to create representations of the world around us using our minds. Much of his research has focused on the human brain's ability to recognize faces and read through the emotions behind facial expressions. Using a pioneering approach to cognitive neuroscience, he discovered that brain, our brain is equipped with specialized neural machinery for face processing. This machinery has different regions, each dedicated to a different dimension of facial information. Some parts may handle how you respond emotionally to a smile or a frown. Others may activate neurons in a memory center where you see a familiar face, enabling you to recognize or a friend or family member. Collectively, these regions form a face processing network that allows us to read all kinds of nonverbal cues from our fellow humans. I'm sure some of you know when you're in trouble with a, a family member by just by looking at their faces, right? I think this is kind of what we're talking about. Vinrick's finding ha findings have had important implications for the understanding of conditions such as autism spectrum disorder, major depression, and prosopagnosia, the inability to recognize individual faces. His work may also have implications for information technology. If we can understand how our brains compute complicated inputs like faces, we may learn something valuable for artificial intelligence. Vinrick came to Rockefeller in 2009 as an assistant professor. He was promoted to professor in 2018 and is also a founding co-director of Rockefeller University's Price Family Center for the Social Brain, an interdisciplinary center here at the university devoted to the neuroscience of social behavior. In today's program, Dr. Frywald is going to discuss in more detail our brain's facial recognition network. He will also discuss how, even though we cannot directly look at our own faces, we can build a complex picture of ourselves in our minds, the titular doppelganger in your head. How we picture ourselves through these networks helps to define our personalities and determine how we interact with each other in social situations. You will have plenty of time to ask Vinrick questions following his talk. Be sure to use your notebooks to jot down key facts or any questions you might have throughout the lecture. Dr. Fywald might even have some questions for you in the audience, and, and we'll, we'll have a couple special prizes if you're able to answer the questions correctly. I'll try to toss them out like Oprah, but not if they're hard things, then I'll hand them to you. Uh, it's not a car, everybody. <laughs> 
at noon, we will go outside. At, uh, oh, no. At noon, we're just going to go right upstairs, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to interact with college students, postdocs, graduate students, and spend more time with Finric asking the Ask Finric Anything, so our version of an AMA, uh, right here after the talk. And now, please welcome Dr. Vinrick Freiwald to the podium. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, very kind, uh, Jean. Um, good morning, everyone, um, especially the hardcore uh, faction who got up uh, here so early on this cold uh, Saturday morning. I'm, I'm deeply grateful for so many of you to be here. Um, I have to say that I only realized this morning uh, what a big production this whole thing was. Um, so before I say anything else, I would like to uh, thank you for coming. Um, I know that your teachers a lot of extra work, um, so shout out to your uh, teachers to make this possible. Lots of people at Rockefeller, I just realized this morning just how many. Um, so thank you so much to all of you for, uh, for making this, this happen. I'm particularly happy uh, to be here this morning and see um, the faces of uh, you, the students, um, because it reminds me of a time roughly 40 years ago when I was your age. Um, and I actually got interested in the brain. And uh, so how did that happen? So obviously I was a nerdy um, kid. And um, I was starting to wonder, like, how is it possible that we can know anything at all about the outside world? Then I realized and I was not the first one to ask that question. So people like Immanuel Kant um, published on this 1781. So um, this is from the Enlightenment period um, of philosophy. And he had a particular answer uh, to that question. So you also then start to wonder about the relationship of your subjective sense of self and the brain. I learned that there was such a thing as a brain and that you know, there were good reasons to believe that it was um, connected to my experience of myself. And um, you might have heard that as well. So again, there are different answers. This is one that I don't necessarily particularly subscribe to. Um, but this is a collaboration of a philosopher um, and actually a Nobel Prize winning uh, neuroscientist to you know, to try to think, like, how is it possible that we have this experience? This is something very unique, and I hope that you all have this sense of wonder, um, that you have this consciousness of yours, this sense of self, and maybe also uh, wonder, like, what the relationship is to the brain. I will not answer that question uh, for you today. So this might be a question for you for your entire life. But keep the sense of wonder. This is our brain. It's beautiful. Um, and it's very complicated. So you might get a sense of it uh, by just looking at the folds uh, of, this, uh, of this organ. It is very uh, complex if you just uh, look at it. It has to be, right? Um, if this is the place that enables us to think, to feel, to act, it has to be complicated. It's also very beautiful inside. If you look, it consists of cells, like many organs or all organs of our bodies, it consists of cells. Um, but the cells in the brain are special. Um, well, maybe I'm biased. I think they are especially beautiful. OK, so here you have a few cells. Um, this is about the size of like a hundredth of a millimeter, so they're very small. But they're these very, very long, elongated uh, parts of them. They're called um, dendrites um, up here so they're, because they look a bit like a tree. And that must mean something, right, that they have these very particular shapes. This is not something new, but it was noticed uh, over 100 years ago uh, by this gentleman, uh, Ramon Y. Cajal, um, who you know, had uh, tools at the time. We learned you know, that there was no advanced technology at the time, but he had like, ways to slice a brain. He had ways to, uh, to uh, dye a brain. And then what he would see under his little microscope here looked something like this. Beautiful, right? You have nerve cells here. Some of them are, um, are labeled. You can see they have all different shapes. They have all these, these fine connections. Uh, you would think that they're connected to each other, uh, most likely, um, even though those contacts were not visible at the time. And so you get a sense that the brain is complex at the large scale, if you just look at it with all the folds, and then at the small scale with all these different cell types. And somehow, they make all our experiences, all our thinking, all our acting possible. How do they do this? Um, here is like a larger view, again, for you to appreciate the um, the complexity of these, um, of these neurons. So I already mentioned the, that these neurons have this big tree with all these little processes. And again, this must mean something. Um, they have a core region uh, that is called the soma, or the, the body of the cell. And then they have this, this process here at the bottom uh, that is called uh, the axon. 
And these axons actually do make contacts with other parts, with other neurons at uh, contact points that are called synapses. And why do they do that? Well, so these cells are not only beautifully and exquisitely shaped, but they also have uh, something else that makes them really unique. Um, they can generate so-called action potentials, or like very brief pulses of electrical activity. So all cells um, are like little power generators, just like a thousand times less powerful than uh, our power outlets. So they have um, an electric um, a voltage over their membrane that is surrounding them. But our nerve cells have this ability to generate these very brief pulses. They're just a millisecond long, like a, a thousandth of a second, where they can change the direction of the potential. It's only 100 millivolts large, so again, like about a thousandth of, of, the, uh, of the size um, of the power outlet. So it's a very small signal, but they can generate this, this very brief pulse. And what's really cool about this is that it can travel. Okay, so they generate uh, the pulse somewhere here at the cell body, and then it can travel down the axon all the way to all the points where this axon is contacting other cells through the synapses. And then downstream, it can elevate um, the membrane potential of the downstream neurons just a little bit. If enough of those are combined and the threshold is reached, then that cell will also reach an action potential, and so on and so forth. So what we have here is this complex neuron. And you might get a sense now, like, why are there all these, uh, all these arborizations? Why are there all these contacts? Well, because this cell, in particular, wants to be in contact with many other cells. How does it do it? It has to have these many branches. It has to have all of these little extra contact points uh, to be contacted by many other cells. So this particular cell can be contacted by 1,000 or 10,000 other cells. So what we have then um, is, this, is this network um, of cells that are firing action potentials that are traveling down the axons to uh, excite other cells. They might generate an action potential, and so on and so forth. One very cool thing about this is that we can actually monitor this activity with a little uh, electrode. It's just a metal wire, very thin. It's insulated. Only at its tip, the metal is exposed. And if this action potential is generated, we can pick it up. Again, it's a tiny little signal. We have to amplify it a lot, but we can pick it up. So in a way, we can listen in to what this neuron is doing, this particular cell uh, that we are recording from, from here. OK, so what does this all mean? So in 1943, uh, uh, mathematicians were thinking about this, and they were saying, hmm, this is interesting. You know, so you have um, this, this very complex cell, but in essence, uh, what it's doing is something like a logical operation, because the action potential can either be there, let's call this a 1, or it cannot be there, it's a 0. So it's a bit like a binary device that can either be on or off at a very fast time scale. It can change this you know, uh, multiple times within a second. And so they said, you know, we can formalize this. Um, this is um, the so-called McCulloch and Pitts neuron. It's a formalization, a mathematical formalization of what this neuron is doing. So I told you it's receiving inputs to the synapses. They're somehow integrated in the soma. We have here the summation sign, but there might be other ways that the neuron is integrating it. And then it compares the outcome of this to this threshold. If the threshold is reached, it's going to flip to 1 briefly. If not, it stays at 0 and then it might um, generate an output. So what McCulloch and Pitts noticed, and this again is like 1943, you might wonder you know, what people were doing in 1943, but amongst other things they were thinking about neurons, is that this is like a little, little logical machine. And if you connect many of these neurons together, they can you know, be something like a computer and they can perform a lot of um, logical operations. So this is one abstraction. Um, so what is the language of the brain? Lots of neurons wired together into a very complicated network. There are action potentials traveling here. Cajal already, he couldn't see that, um, but he was already, just based on the structure, uh, suspecting that this was happening. Action potentials traveling across this network. And that is, in essence, how your brain is working. So the question for us as scientists is, can we make sense of that? Right? If this is the language of the brain, so many cells, so complicated in their connection, can we possibly understand what they're doing? And obviously, I wouldn't be raising the question if you know, the answer wasn't at least partially yes. But I also want to emphasize there are lots of things that we still don't know. Like I mentioned, there are these different cell types. And so we know so much more about them now. We know, you know their genetic profiles. We know 
their biophysical properties, so exactly like how they are integrating. But why there are so many, what exactly they're computing, we don't know. So if you're interested in neuroscience, there's work for you to do. OK, one particular place where we can try to make sense of what the nervous system is doing is in the periphery, in the sensory periphery, uh, where it's connected to the outside world and you know, information is, is coming in, or at the motor side where it's connected to our movements. Those are places that are good for us to study because we can manipulate uh, these inputs or we can uh, monitor these outputs. And so in the back of your eye, uh, which is shown here, you have little specialized cells, uh, the photoreceptors, and the very complicated machineries in and of themselves. But there's only one thing that's of relevance for us today, and that is that these retinal photoreceptors transduce light energy into electrical energy. That's it. So that's the connection of you to the visual world. There's light coming on your eyes through a lens projected on the back of your eye. There are many photoreceptors there, not just one, and they are transducing this pattern of light into electrical activity. The important thing here to realize is that that's it. From this point on, you, have, you are in the language of the brain. This is all the brain has. The brain doesn't have the light anymore. It doesn't have any direct access to the outside world. It only has its own activity patterns, these electrical patterns of activity. So we're coming back to Manuel Kant, like how can a brain like this, you know, that is connected to the eye, how can it now make sense out of this activity that is not directly the light, but it has to infer what happened there on the outside? And this is not a trivial problem. It was realized in philosophy. Um, it's called the brain and the vat problem. How does the brain know it's connected to an outside world at all? It could be fooled, and it is fooled on occasions, and we fool it a lot. Um, so it could be connected. It could be sitting there in a vat that you know, just supplies it with the basic nutrients uh, that it needs to survive. Um, it could be completely disconnected in the way uh, that it thinks it is connected to the outside world. But let's assume that you could connect like every nerve cell to some kind of complex machinery that would control the activity there. Um, the brain would make all kinds of inferences about what, what's out there. And it's a completely made up you know, artificial world that does, that does not exist. Um, so I know that you got trivia questions uh, before today in, in the morning. So I have one more trivia question for you and with a little hint. Um, so which 1999 scientific, um, science fiction movie is based entirely of this idea on the brain in a vet. And I have a little hint for you. Okay, some of you know? The Matrix, the Matrix yes. All right, good. <laughs> so this is the scientific movie, but think about it. Uh, in essence, this is the problem that the, the, the brain has, right? It's not directly connected to the outside world. It only has its own language to figure out what the outside world is like. So if Immanuel Kant is looking out in the outside world and someone hits his eye, what will happen? Well, he will feel some pain locally, uh, maybe, but he'll also see stars. You might have experienced this yourself. I'm not in encouraging you to do th this experiment, but if it happens to you, you see some stars, that's because it's an artificial activation of this photoreceptor through mechanical force. But how does the brain interpret it? It makes you see something, even though there was no light energy there. Just a little example of um, how the brain can go wrong. It can also be used, uh, and it has been used, in early experiments uh, to understand how the brain is organized. The brain itself um, does not have any pain sensors, and the only way for you to feel pain is if a pain sensor is activated or if the parts of the brain that interpret this pain sensor are activated. Just like when you get the sit on the eye, right? Um, the parts of your brain that are interpreting visual information think that something happened in the outside world interprets this as light. Um, the same with pain. You only feel pain. The pain receptor is activated or if somewhere artificially a downstream region is activated. The brain otherwise doesn't, it doesn't have any pain receptors in it. It's not uh, painful. And this has allowed neurosurgeons like Wilder Penfield, um, when they have to do surgery on the human brain, uh, in an awake patient uh, to talk to them while they are artificially activating this brain. So they put on electrodes on the brain, uh, activate it. This is like the 1940s again. 1950s, um, activate <clears throat> a particular part of the brain, and then either observe a movement of a body part 
or you ask you know, the, the patient, what do you experience? And for any part of the brain, he's published uh, big volumes of books for any part of the brain where we stimulate, he could generate a particular feeling. Even very subtle things, like a feeling of deja vu. I have experienced this before. If you stimulate a particular part of the brain, you're going to get this uh, experience. One of the reasons why we think our minds, our subjective experience, is so closely connected to what's going on in the brain. So this is why, why he was able to do this. And just to give you one example, we have this, this complex uh, brain here where we don't know if we can make sense of it at all in, in the beginning. But from experiments like Wilder Penfields, we know that there is an orderly organization. So when he would walk along here and stimulate these different parts of the brain, he would see movements in different parts of the body. So he was proposing that there is a homunculus, uh, if you will, like um, a representation of the human body like this, with some parts like the face being overrepresented, occupying much larger parts of the, of the brain, likely because the presentations, they have to be more fine-grained than for the foot, uh, for example. But there's an entire body shape there. So uh, all your movements um, of your body are mapped onto this part of the brain in an orderly fashion. And so this um, kind of uh, large-scale mapping of the brain has given us a sense of the overall organization of the, of the brain. OK, so coming back to the question of the language of the brain. So we have these, these networks there. So yes, there's an overall organization, but there's these networks of neurons with activity traveling uh, within this network. Can we make sense of it? And yes, we can. So the prime example of this uh, is the visual system. I told you about the eye, about the construction of light energy, uh, intellectual activity in the back of the eye. But it was very apparent for anatomists early on, including Ramon y Cajal, that there is an orderly mapping then from the retina into other parts of the brain. So there is this region here that's called the lateral angelicalis body, which um, you don't have to remember. Um, there's a projection from there to the back of your head uh, into a region called primary visual cortex. And you might wonder, like, if you would now record from a neuron in this part of the brain, what would it do? Is it something that you could possibly understand or not? Why might you not be able to understand it? If the brain is a computer, like a digital computer, let's say you would record from one transistor in, in this computer, would you be able to understand anything at all about what's going on? Likely not. People actually have done this experiment. You're not going to be able to understand anything that's going on. So what about the brain? Is there any, any hope that if we record from a single cell in this, this vast network, that we can understand anything about what the cell is doing? And uh, the answer is yes, but it's, um, I want to emphasize that uh, these kinds of experiments, uh, when they were done, and we are still doing these kinds of experiments, are a bit like an exploration of unknown territory. So I like to link it uh, to the core of discovery um, after the acquisition of the uh, Lucy uh, Tanner uh, territory. Uh, then President Thomas Jefferson sent out this expedition by Lewis and Clark to explore this territory along the Missouri River. And they would know like, what they would find around the next corner. So if you do these kinds of experiments, it's a bit like that. right? You have some prior information, um, but you don't really know what you're going to find. And you might be surprised, and then it's, 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 um, it's a very joyful experience. This experience is what uh, these two men had, um, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, who we can see here from the back, who was president at Rockefeller uh, for uh, many years. And they were recording in the back of the brain. Um, while they're presenting stimuli with a slide projector that you can see there, also technology, cutting edge technology at the time, and then recording activity from a cell. So I'm going to lower the lights now for you, uh, because luckily there is a recording of one of those experiments, and you can see uh, how it goes. And maybe you can figure out by just like seeing what's, what's happening there, what they discovered, what these cells are doing. <clears throat> OK, this is, uh, sorry. So this is the sound of a cell. So I mentioned to you we can record this activity that's like a wire next to the cell. It's a very small signal, but we can amplify it. They could amplify it. And then you can put it on, an, on a speaker. OK, so while you're presenting a visual stimulus, you can listen to what the neuron is doing. And that's the experience that you have in the experiment. And it's almost exactly the same experience that, that you're going to have now. OK, sorry for that. OK. This is their stimulus with a slide projector. You get the cell getting active. OK, wait. OK, 
Okay, the live fire has to be at a very precise location to elicit a response. Move it slightly away, you don't get a response. Right, it has to be there where, this, where the crosses are. You hear the two guys talking in the background? Also part of the experiment. They think this region is responding when you turn the light off. So now you don't get a response. Right? You're going over these regions with the crosses, they gave a response before, but now if you're going over them with a different direction, you're not getting a response. Only now you're getting a response when the orientation of the bar is just right. It has to be the right position, it must have the right orientation, that's when the cell is going to respond. Okay, so... That was your brief trip for a minute into a science lab uh, in the 1950s, 1960s. And some of the experiments that we're doing today are still very much like this. So what did they discover? The visual world of a single neuron in primary visual cortex is not the entire world. It's focused on a small region which we call the receptive field. So they only get a response in one particular location in the outside world, move the stimulus over a little bit, no response at all. But it's computing an interesting quantity, and that quantity is the orientation of the bar. So why might you want to do this? So there are different ideas about this. One is illustrated here. is that you're getting a two-dimensional sketch of the most important features of a visual stimulus. I'm not saying the most important quality um, of a teddy bear is necessarily the different oriented lights, but if you think about this from a perspective of uh, visual information processing, what is the most important information? That's where the high contrasts are, that's computed before, and then what the different orientations are. So if you just plot this here, you get a sketch uh, of what the, what the teddy bear looks like. This is what is accomplished in this part of the brain. There are lots of cells, you know, so that the entire visual world is covered, that all orientations are covered, and so there's a translation then of this activity pattern that comes to the eye in one in this particular brain region that is reflecting the location, uh, but also the orientation. And this is, um, this is really amazing, because you can, you can do this experiment in every time it works. This is like a basic fact about your brains. This is how your brain is working. Shortly after, uh, this man, Charles Gross, uh, was recording from a different part of the brain. So back here, um, this is primary visual cortex, where these oriented cells are. He was recording from this part of the brain. And it was known, based on lesions of the brain, that this is critical for uh, an animal, in this case um, a macaque monkey, uh, to recognize an object. So he would present stimuli like this one here, of a face, of a complex, meaningful visual object. And controls like a hand, another meaningful object, but clearly not uh, a face. Maybe you recognize this, this is a scrambled face, it has all the local features like the eyes and so, but in the wrong configuration. And while he's presenting the stimuli, just like you were in Wiesel, were presenting the different oriented uh, bars, he would record activity in this part of the brain and was wondering what he might find. And what he would find is this. So we have a plot here. Time runs from left to right. On the vertical axis, you see this uh, voltage trace of this cell that is recorded. And every time there's a vertical line, that's an action potential. So if you would listen to this, it would be quiet. You turn on this, the stimulus of the face, it would go You would hear it, and then nothing. If you present the hand, no response. And they did a couple of uh, different stimuli. So this particular cell would respond you know, to the monkey face, to human face. If you take out the eyes, for example, the response is still there, but it's weaker. So you get some ideas about like, what the cell might be doing. But it's definitely a face-selective cell. OK, and this is amazing, uh, because what are the odds that you would stick your electrode somewhere in the brain and you would find like, a meaningful response like this? Very low. In fact, lots of people at the time did not believe that this existed, because the finding was made before you could document things like this. A paper at the time was written by a description of what they did, and it wasn't helped by the fact that one of the control stimuli was actually um, a toilet brush. 
and they found some cells that would respond selectively to the toilet brush. And so it was very easy for people to dismiss that and saying, you know, okay, so there are these, these weird papers that these weird stimuli, you know, in the back of your mind, including a toilet brush. Um, this is very, very hard to believe that something like this should exist, like a simple, meaningful representation of like a meaningful thing in the outside world. But I can tell you, I've now recorded thousands of these cells, they exist. Uh, they're very real, and this is like, again, part of the reality of, of your brain as well. You have these cells as well that respond selectively to faces. Why are there face cells? Because faces are so important. They contain so much information, but others, Jeannie was already referring to this. If you see a picture like this in a fraction of a second, I could long have taken this away, and you would have gotten information about identity, gender, age, race, species, similarity, attractiveness, trustworthiness, I should emphasize, perceived trustworthiness, not actual one, but you will form an opinion about how trustworthy this person is in a fraction of a second, about the mood of the person and where this person is paying attention to, if at all. All of this you get from the face in like a, a fraction of a second. We are a very social species. All primates are very social species. We need this information to function in our social lives, and we get this from faces uh, in just a fraction of a second. The brain is doing that for us. We don't even have to think about it. It's an automatic process. How is it doing this? This is what we're trying to, to figure out. So, but this is not just passive information that is there, right? So if you envision that I've been presenting to you so far is that you know, there's all this information out there hidden, implicitly in these patterns of light activity, and the brain is there to extract you know, these underlying causes um, behind these, these patterns. But faces are not just passive, they are actually active, so they are manipulating us. So here I have a video of a three-day-old macaque monkey sitting there watching this experimenter, and it's going to take some time until you know, the main cause of this experiment um, will be revealed. So he's getting a little interested. Wait for it. Now he's capturing his attention. And he's very interested in the face. Catch it again. Now the experimenter is opening his mouth. And after some deliberation, he decides to reciprocate this facial movement with its own facial movement. OK. So the reason why I've been showing this, and actually this video might have gotten me my job at Rockefeller. It was part of my, uh, the talk that I gave to apply here. And I gave it to say that there might be something there at birth, A, allowing this animal to recognize faces in the outside world. And we have no idea how the brain could have possibly wired up without any experience of faces in the outside world to do that. Second, on the motor side, that there's a close link between the perception of the face and the generation of facial movements mimicking the one of the experimenter. But what I actually did not realize, and it took me a couple of presentations with this video, is that I'm massively manipulating the audience, right? Isn't he so cute, <laughs> right? You have this immediate emotional reaction to him that you cannot suppress, you know? Yes, it's also, you know, like a little bit like, the, you know, the, the cuddly body and, you know, the, um, the blanket and, and whatnot. But if you just see, like, the face, he would have a very strong emotional reaction to it. So this is like an inroad for us to understand the emotion. Same with the babies manipulating you uh, in and out uh, to do things that they want you to do because they're so darn cute, right? Your brain is doing all of that for you don't have to think about it. So manipulating you. If you see a picture of a famous person, this is Charles Darwin, your memory is being activated. And we have a pretty good understanding now like, like how that is happening, right? It's not just a face. It's a face of a particular person that you know well, and so your memory is activated, you might you know, think of something that you published, something that you know about him, you know, this biology lesson where you first heard about him, and you know, uh, what not. <clears throat> okay, so there's another way in which uh, faces are manipulating you, another little demonstration of this. Um, I have these specialty glasses. So these are not my eyes, they're still here, right? <laughs> but you think I'm looking there, right? Is that right? This way, okay, good, so I got this wrong. So, so this way, right, because it seems my eyes are looking there. Your attention is automatically drawn in that direction. Actually, once I gave this talk and someone was walking through a door like this, and, um, but uh, that's not the point, it's not predictive of anything. But there's, this is manipulating, this eye, eye stimulus is manipulating your attention system. Again, you have no way of controlling this, your attention is drawn over there, going back to my face, am I still looking there? I am not, but my eyes seem to indicate to you that I am, right, so there's something interesting must be happening there. So faces are massively manipulative. Um, they're doing actively things uh, to you. And in this case, um, oops, in this case, <coughs> controlling your attention system. OK, so faces are very important, very powerful social stimuli. OK, so you get all this information uh, from faces. How does it work? 
Well, some of this we understand, but let's uh, take a step back. So some of you might know, might know this movie. It's an illustration of um, a situation where someone is an eyewitness of a crime. And it's a reminder for me also to tell you that our face recognition abilities are limited. We make mistakes. So in 70% of cases where there's been a wrongful conviction in court because of a wrongful test, in 70% of the cases, it's because an eyewitness stood up and said, I saw this person, and the witness was wrong. We know this from DNA evidence that is, uh, in many cases, one of the leading causes of wrongful conviction. It's because people thought they'd recognize a face, and they didn't correctly. You can think it's about the stress, but it's not just the stressful situation that a witness might be in. Um, there are limitations to face recognition, and that's because it's inherently a difficult process. And we tend to overestimate our ability to do so, and I'll tell you later in the talk like why that uh, is or why this might be. So let's test your eyewitness recognition abilities. I'm going to show to you a display of um, 44 pictures of faces, and I'll ask you how many different people are in there, right? So 44 pictures, how many people? It can be at most 44 different ones, maybe fewer. Okay, so I'm going to let you look at this for like 10 seconds, and then you can tell me like how many uh, you saw. Okay. Remember, you're going to be the eyewitness. Okay, show of hands, how many saw the same person in all the 44 different pictures? One of you. Two. One. Three. Okay, a few more. Four. Five. Six or more. Okay, good. Well, actually, it's two. But you just like everyone, well, I shouldn't say that, put it this way. Your performance here, like indicating that the majority of you think it's six or more, that's exactly what in a, in a scientific experiment where people were tested on their face recognition abilities, what most of the people said, six or seven. I'm outlining here the pictures of the same face. And in some ways, this, this problem is reduced here because these are all pictures at the same size of the face looking at you. But there are some variations here that make it difficult. You know, some emotional expressions, uh, some changes in, in, in lighting conditions, changes in, in hairstyle, but um, that's it, right? So it shouldn't really be that hard if we were like that good in the face recognition, but we're limited and we make, uh, make mistakes. Um, so two different individuals here, okay. So let's think about like all the things that have to come together for you to be able to recognize faces. The first thing is uh, what we call face detection. You see here like a social scene from The Godfather, the lighting conditions are difficult, but none of you will have difficulties uh, detecting three faces in the social scene, even though they are different sizes because they're different distances, because the head orientation is different and the lighting conditions are changing. There are three faces. This is what we call face detection, knowing that there is a face and where it is. And then you can count them if you have multiple like in this situation. So this is a basic process, face detection. But if you have multiple faces, there's this other process, and this is what the previous test was alluding to. Um, this is a little hard to see because of lighting conditions here, but uh, these are pictures which on a pixel by pixel basis are very similar to each other because the lighting conditions are similar. Our faces have all the same structure. They're both looking forward, but they belong to two different people. The next thing that you want to know about a face is the identity, right? And so these pictures, they belong to the same identity, even though physically these pictures are very different. If you think about V1, for example, uh, if you, even if you would have a transformation of this image into this, this oriented uh, orientation, uh, elements, these two pictures will be much more dissimilar to each other than these, but these two belong to the same person and these two to different ones. So the next process is called face discrimination. This is your ability to perceive two pictures that are physically different as more similar to each other because they belong to the same person. There's an underlying cause that your brain somehow inferred and that underlying cause is the identity of this person, or more precisely, the physical properties of their face. Face discrimination, okay. So how does it all work in the brain? Um, at first, we don't know, but uh, we're employing a different technique to uh, the one that I showed you from Wilder Penfield. We're using fMRI, brain imaging. You must have seen in magazines and other places these beautiful pictures of brains where there are like, certain like, hotspots coming up. Um, what we are doing, essentially, is to present pictures of faces and pictures of non-faces. And for every part of the brain, we can now compare 
are they more active by faces or more active by these non-faces? If faces, they're going to, you're going to plot this as yellow or red. If the others, it's going to be blue. What we find, this is a computer-inflated version of this macaque monkey brain, is that there are six regions, precisely, in each hemisphere, left and right, that are face selective. It's very producible across animals. We can give them names, and we can find the same regions back in different animals. And they exist in a sea of blue, regions that are responding to other things more than to faces. So six regions that are face selective. What we can do now is to do the Hubel and Wiesel experiment, but not here in V1, but here we can now put the electrode right into region that our scouting technique tells us is responding more to faces than to non-faces. And again, you know, we could turn off the, turn, <laughs> turn the light, like in the human weasel experiment. Um, this is what we, what we find. So this is a video taken from a control monitor. The quality is not great, but I hope you can see the different stimuli. And once I stop talking, you might appreciate what the cell is responding to. So I hope you realize that every time there's a face, there's a response. It is not completely perfect. Sometimes there are like weak responses to things that are not faces. And um, these are often things that look like faces, but you know that they are not. So I really love this picture of these sliced peppers because there's reasons to be like really angry, losing their teeth and whatnot because they've just been cut. You know these are not faces, right? But there's a part of your brain that tells you these must be faces, right? With a particular facial expression, they're angry. This is the part of the brain that's doing that, okay? So there are particular regions of your brain uh, that are entirely devoted to faces and they want to see the outside world interpreted as a face stimulus. If there's no evidence for it, they're gonna stay quiet. If there's some evidence for it, like these peppers or other things that look like faces, even things like clock faces that are roundish, that share symmetry, have an internal structure, they will partially activate this region. And so this is why you have a tendency to see faces and things that you know, you know, based on your world experience are not faces. Okay, so for us, this is great. Uh, because what Charles Gross couldn't do, because it was very difficult for him to find face selective cells, is we can now record from face selective cells every day. We know we have to, where we have to go to one of these yellow and red regions, we will find a face selective cell, and now we can ask very detailed questions about how they are coding faces. Not just monitor that they're responding to faces, but how are they coding faces. And I'll give you one vignette of that. Okay, so we're getting closer to the mechanism. So here is a set of images that easily you recognize as a very simplified cartoon versions of faces deliberately made of very simple geometric objects, right? So they're just like ellipses and lines and that uh, made together. We base this on an average face that's shown here in the middle. It um, was a picture of a face of uh, Tom Cruise, as you might uh, recognize from this. And so that we took as the standard face. And then we have manipulations, right? So we have here the aspect ratio of the face is changing. It's actually was 11 different versions. Not all of them are shown here. From something like uh, sesame character Ernie on the left-hand side with a very flat face to Bert on the right with a very narrow face. And deliberately, we chose this range of faces to exceed the one that you would normally experience. I can tell you that the whole variation of human faces lives in a very small subregion of this space, you know, around this, this average here. You will never see a face as, as flat as Ernie's. You will never see as one that's as narrow as Bert's. Uh, another manipulation we did was the iris size. No irises at all and very big ones on the right, so we're going from one extreme to the other. Into eye distance, for example, an almost cyclopean arrangement on the left where the eyes touch each other, something you'll never see in real life, uh, to the eyes straddling the outside of the face, something you also don't see. So why are we doing this? Because now we have a very quantitative way of characterizing the response of a cell and a very interesting stimulus that looks a bit like a talking cartoon character, but all that's happening here is that we are updating all these different dimensions, 19 different dimensions of this cartoon stimulus, randomly, several times a second. And this is how it looks like. Now we can record activity from a cell while the stimulus is running. In this case, you can listen to it all you want. It's gonna be very difficult for you to figure out what's going on because the stimulus is changing so fast. But can the cells figure out what's going on? Yes, they can, and we can analyze it in a particular way that brings that up. So 19 different dimensions, 19 different ways you can manipulate this face, you know, like Ernie Bird, big eyes, small eyes, into eye distance manipulation, 19 different versions of that. And so we're gonna ask, is the activity of the cell changing with one dimension independent of the 18 others? So the height of the feature assembly, when that varies, does it matter? 
And then we can ask for the next dimension, big pupils, small pupils, Ernie to Bert, irrespective of all the other dimensions. For all these 19 ones, we can ask, does the cell vary its activity in, uh, when, when this particular property is changing? And this would tell us that it carries information about that. And the answer is yes. So here's one example cell with like 19 different dimensions, and four of them, which I'm enlarging here, change, uh, cause a change in the firing rate of the cell. So this cell does not respond very much to Ernie, but to Bert likes the eyes close together and not apart, likes the, uh, the eyes uh, open and not closed, and likes big irises, not small irises. So it, it, it's almost like the cell is taking a ruler and taking a measurement of the face, of four different parameters of this face, and relaying this to all the other cells it's connected to. That's, that's what it's doing. It's measuring facial properties. So that's interesting because if you can take a measurement of a face, it means that you can determine what it's similar to and what it's dissimilar to, right? And so all this information, social information you're getting in the end uh, from a face. I emphasize the meaningful information that is in the face, but you can ask, you know, what really is a face? And from a vision perspective, a face is a three-dimensional object with a very particular structure, right? There are always two eyes. The two eyes are above the nose. There's only one nose. The one nose is above the mouth, and so on and so forth. That structure is the same. What varies are the different features, maybe the um, spacing of the features. You know, some people have the eyes closer together, others further apart. Um, but it's this variation on a basic theme of consistent structure that the system has to pick out. And so what does that mean? Is we can measure faces. People in the field call it uh, biometrics. Uh, that's what they are doing, measuring uh, facial properties. You know, they're different ones showing here, you can pick out you know, your favorite features and you can characterize them, uh, this face physically by a number of features. If you have a list of, of features, um, you can also call them dimensions and you can think of them you know, as axes in a space. So it's only difficult to imagine because typically there are more than three features, but if you had three, it would be like a point somewhere in a three-dimensional space. Right? So one particular face with particular kind of measurements would be in this point of space and another one in a different one. Here's an illustration. Um, so different real faces were taken, uh, were um, somewhat simplified, and then you can create the anti-face. So this, these faces are more roundish, you know, fuller. These ones are more narrow. You can see like differences in eyebrow shape and so on and so forth. So for every face that there is, you can artificially in your computer, you can construct faces that look similar, and you can construct faces that look just the opposite. It's a bit like a color space in two dimensions. Right, it's like there's red and the opposite of red is turquoise and so on and so forth. And so for every face, uh, there's also an anti-face. That's how we perceive faces. You know, it's these um, points in face space systematically organized by their similarity. And if you have cells like these that uh, do these measurements, well, they actually provide a way for many cells of these together to construct uh, this space inside of your head where these, these measurements determine like how similar or dissimilar these faces look, including the doppelganger, you know, the look-alike, um, that you know, where just the physical properties of the face are very similar to yours. OK, so I've shown to you that we can use fMRI to localize different parts of the brain that are responding um, selectively to faces that live in this region that is object selective, um, but not uh, there for faces. And I've shown you like one example of a cell in this region here that is responding selectively to faces. You remember the cell was responding every time there was a face shown. Uh, it was not infallible, but it was close to, to that. So it helps us with face detection, sometimes maybe overreacting, telling us that the face where there's not. So what are these other face areas good for? I'll show you one cell from this region, very typical. There are many of those cells there. And I'll give you some prior information look out for these pictures here. They all belong to the same individual and in different orientations. So the cell is very quiet, but every time there's a picture of this particular individual, there's a response of the cell. Okay, it's a little harder to see than the response to faces, but I hope you saw that. Now, importantly, this is a recording uh, from a subject that's never seen this person in real life. This response is not generated because of any individual familiarity with this particular individual. 
So how can the response be specific? Because of the physical properties of the face. They're different from the physical properties of other faces there. So it's a different part of face space. This is what makes it unique. Somehow the cell is able, A, to figure out the specifics and only respond when very specific features are there. And we can try to figure out what these features are. And secondly, and this is really important, it can do so independently of how the head is oriented. And remember, like for face discrimination, that was our requirement. You're able to lump things together that physically as images are very different from each other, that like this and this, because they belong to the same individual. There's a common underlying cause for this. And the brain is somehow able to figure this out, even seeing these images for the first time ever. So we have here a correlate of face uh, discrimination. Now, we also figured out that these uh, regions, even though I call them islands, you know, in a, in a sea of blue, they're actually connected to each other. They're nodes in a face processing network. And so we can think of one representation as the input to the other, another input, uh, representation as the input to another. And so the different representations that exist here, and I will not show you all of them, but each of these regions, um, represented here by different colors, has a unique way of looking at faces, right? Like one, to detect faces, uh, another one to discriminate faces, and so on and so forth. And so this is a network of activity where the result of one computation is informing uh, the other. And so we have two major uh, transformations here from this area, detecting faces to the one discriminating faces. Okay, but there's something in addition here, and um, this came out in this study um, that uh, we did as, a, as an experiment here amongst ourselves with the two, sorry, with the two different uh, faces there. Um, so for me, it's very easy uh, to, to do this, not because I'm particularly good at, at faces, um, but because I know one of these two people in person. It's one of the authors of the study. He's a known person in face recognition. So I'm personally familiar with him. And there's a very cool control um, uh, that they did. Uh, so they did the same experiment, but now they took um, faces of Dutch celebrities. And we're testing them on British subjects and on Dutch subjects. British subjects, again, said on average, you know, there are six to seven different people in this array of 44 different images. Dutch people, every single one of them said two. It was very easy for them because of this personal familiarity. And so this is a big distinction between face discrimination, where you can tell the difference between uh, two different faces just based on the physical properties, and differences that you can tell of people that you're intimately familiar with. And that's the main reason why we think that eyewitnesses are going wrong. It's because our everyday experience is with faces of people that we know very well. But you might sometimes realize you know, that you, if you bump into a person that you, know, you might know from class, um, but maybe not that well, and you, know, you bump into them in the supermarket, it might take you like a while to recognize, oh yeah, this is this, is this person. Right? So for us, though subjectively, this, um, the perception of a face and the recognition of a person that we know, they seem to be the same thing. But they're not. These are like two different things that are closely connected to each other. So if you have seen The Godfather, and if you're good like person memory, you will remember, ah, oh, yeah, you know, this is uh, Amirijo uh, Bonasiera, and then this is like another person. Um, that is your personal familiarity now with these, uh, with these people. And so we're very interested to know, like, where in the brain is that happening? And uh, Sophia Landi was the grad student here at Rockefeller um, who figured that out. Um, so she was amazing. And, uh, it started with a very simple experiment, the same that we always do. I told you, you know, we're contrasting activity to faces with uh, activity to, to objects. But this time, now we took like faces, familiar faces. This is just a symbol picture of, of, with Breda Ginsburg here, um, like a personally familiar picture of that particular subject and a personally familiar object. And if we now run this contrast, it looks the same um, as for non-familiar objects, except that there are two additional regions, um, sort of in this part of your brain down here. Uh, that is very mysterious, uh, that's enlarged a lot in the human brain compared to others. Um, and here she found activity that we had not seen before, now looking at these familiar stimuli. This is an indication that maybe this region is exactly for that, to link the perception of a face to the memory of a person. Um, but um, Sophia had some additional evidence, and so it's an interesting experiment that I would also like to do with you. So here we have two highly blurred images. Especially those of you sitting in the back can probably guess that these are highly blurred images of faces, um, but they're so strongly blurred that you know, it might not even be clear that it's faces, but I'm going to give you that. Okay, so what we're going to do now over the course of roughly half a minute is we're going to unblur first this image and then this one here. And when you recognize something, you know, shout it out. Hmm? 
Wow, that is, that is early. OK. Uh, you're right. It's Obama. And so now we're adding more and more information. Those of you who said Obama will you know, feel pretty good about themselves you know, because there's more evidence showing that it is Obama. You were right about it. You can do this with familiar individuals from the gist of the face. You don't need the localized features. You can get this you know, from the overall impression in a highly blurred image. Not super highly blurred. You need some information. OK, let's do this one more time. Everyone got Obama here? Got some disagreement? It's Obama. OK, what about this one here? I haven't even started unblurring yet. Uh, I intended to, but it didn't happen. OK, now, now it's happening. So some already know it's Martin Luther King. OK, so uh, it's not Martin Luther King. Uh, <laughs> Those of you who shouted out Martin Luther King are quiet now. You know, the evidence <laughs> is, is against that interpretation. Has anyone else any idea who that is? No. And that's the point. You don't know this person. <laughs> so the point of this experiment is if you unblur, slowly unblur an image of a person that you know, there's this moment of recognition, this aha moment. I know who that is. It's Obama, right? And here, you don't know. It's a half-brother of Obama's, but that, that's you know, that, who you don't know, OK? So if you have a generic face processing system, what might happen is that activity is slowly going up, maybe in this linear fashion, as over time, as we give more and more detail about this face, because now more and more cells are becoming activated. But if this region is involved in the recognition of familiar individuals in this aha moment, there might be nothing happening for some time. And then there might be the surge of activity at the moment of recognition. And then as we provide more and more information, you already knew it was Obama, right? So this really doesn't really give you more activity. That's the idea of this prediction, is that you can now probe in the brain, every part of the brain, does it show this kind of dependency on the stimulus? Then it's a generic face processing area. Or does it show this dependency? Then it's more likely to be involved in the recognition of familiar faces. Most of the areas that we, uh, we knew about show this linear dependency, responding a little bit more to if it's when it's a familiar face, but showing the same dependency for familiar faces in red and unfamiliar faces in blue. But these two areas that uh, Sophia discovered show this nonlinear response as predicted and only for familiar faces, and also only for familiar faces, not familiar uh, other stimuli. So it's specific for familiar faces. In fact, when we record in there, we find, or Sophia found, very, very cool cells. Um, so here we are plotting from top to bottom all kinds of different stimuli. And you can see some examples there. That's the face of me in the human familiar category. Time runs from left to right. Big responses are in red and uh, yellow, no responses in black. You can see the cell is awfully quiet most of the time, except for one particular picture of one particular individual. So it's encoding one particular personally familiar face. That's how faces are represented there. Not necessarily as points in face space, but in terms of whether these are familiar individuals or non-familiar individuals. It's a third very different representation of faces in this face processing network. So that's roughly our understanding of the system. There's much more research to do that we're currently doing to understand the system better. Um, but it's a network of face areas existing in your brains as well. Different kinds of face representations in different parts of this network. One for face detection, one for discrimination, and then one for interacting with memory for, uh, familiar, for familiarity uh, detection and identification of people uh, that you personally know. OK. And there are two major transformations. OK. So, we set out you know, trying to wrap our minds around you know, the, the brain and its complexity and, and how we can figure it out. And I raised the question, can we understand anything at all? But you might wonder, like, what does understanding really mean? And you can get a sense from like, how I'm presenting sense uh, information to you about the brain that I have particular interest in the brain that have to do with the brain being a kind of biological computer. You could have other interests. You could have other interests in the, you know, the biochemical compositions, especially if you're interested in, in, in diseases. Um, there are differences in the biochemical composition. You might be interested in other aspects. There are lots of different ways you can be in interested in the brain. Our interest is in the brain as an information processing system like a computer. So what does it mean to understand something completely? One of the criteria was given uh, by the physicist Richard Feynman a while ago. He said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. In other words, if you really understand something, you should be able to create something that works just like it. If you want, mathematical models of things are that. 
it's not a physical reproduction, but you build you know, equations that you can uh, then find solutions for and that you can then test and see if you do new experiments, if they're able to capture this new result. This is one way of understanding. Now here, complex uh, information processing system, what you might want to ask yourself is, can I build a computer that behaves just the way at, as the system? And if you're saying just this way, there are different ways, you know, how, how detailed this can be. Um, but we are very interested in building artificial computer systems that would show all the main properties of this biological uh, information processing system of ours, not the entire brain, but this face processing network. And if you're interested in this, we're going to have a demonstration of exactly how you can do this, you know, what these different computational systems are outside. I will just give you the flavor of it. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting uh, demonstration that we have out there for you. So you have it on your phone, you have it elsewhere in the internet, now artificial systems that can recognize faces. Um, this was a revolution in artificial intelligence that um, began about 10 years ago and you know, until recently where it's now uh, large language models. The technology behind it is actually based on neuroscience. These networks are called deep convolutional networks and they're called deep because you give them an image and then there are several layers of processing. One, doing something, uh, some transformation Early on, very similar to what we saw in V1, extracting, for example, the orientation of different elements of the picture. It's not something you gave this computer, but it learned. It was trained on millions of examples, and the better systems are just the ones that are trained on more and more examples, and the ones that use more and more of these layers here. But they're trained on millions of examples where someone knew this is a face of John, and so the system is then giving feedback. If it says it's John, you know, it gets feedback saying that everything's okay. If it gets it wrong, there are going to be changes made to what? The connections between the neurons at the synapses. This is like learning, which I didn't talk about, but um, plasticity and, and learning happen mostly at the synapses, the context that are changed. Remember the McCulloch and Pitts neuron was a, an abstraction that said, you know, if you have a network of neurons, each of them can be in a state of zero or one. It's a, like a logical computer-like machine. This is a particular version of that. In this line here, there are many of these neurons stacked up, analyzing part of the world. They're connected to others, passing this information down, and then you get an answer, and oftentimes this is correct. These systems are so good now that they sometimes outperform us. Sometimes humans are still better than them. And it's based on analyses like this that we propose something that is very different and completely different, and that is that, yes, we can use a deep convolutional network, but now what we're doing is uh, we are um, using it for an internal model of your face. And just like in this example that I showed to you um, of this cartoon stimulus, where you saw like a cell measuring these different properties, what we think is happening is that this information is used not to give you the answer like who is in the image right away, but to specify the parameters of this internal model, to say, you know, the eyes of this person must be close together, uh, this must be the orientation of the head, and so with, you know, some like 30 plus um, parameters like these, you can now set this internal model to explain this external stimulus. So it's not like a kind of mindless way like the artificial systems that, that, um, that are out there, right now, or at least most of them are working, after you know, massive, massive training, it will give you the right answer, but it will not know uh, why, the, uh, why the answer is correct. Here we have a system that understands what is happening. It understands that now it's an image of a face. It understands that now it's an image of a face at a particular orientation where the light is coming from a particular direction. And so this is what I meant by the doppelganger in your head. If this is correct, if you have really have this machinery, it's a proposal that we are making. We have some evidence for it, but it's not fully established. Um, if that is true, then you have a model of the outside world in your head and as you see, a face coming in is you know, going to shape itself to the shape of the incoming face. And so you have like an, kind of like a doppelganger of this outside world inside of your head. So what is the evidence that we have for that to happen? And we also have a demonstration of that outside. Um, the most compelling uh, evidence is actually something that we did not discover, but something that was already out there. Um, and it's an illusion. So I told you, you know, we like to fool the brain, like one way we like to fool the brain is you know, by giving it illusion. So here is this, this illusion, it's called the hollow face, uh, hollow face illusion. We're gonna do this experiment. So what do you see here? Albert Einstein. And it looks like a bust, right? Like he's, something is protruding here coming out. Okay, so now we're gonna set this into a rotation movement. So 
So it seems to be turning to the left, but now you realize something weird is happening. You actually looked into the concave part of the mass. Now it's looking at you. But it's forward facing. It seems to rotate a different way, but physically it's rotating the same way. Now you're looking into the back of the mass again, and now something's happening, right? So something flips in your perception that it looks again like it's coming out and looking at you. Let's start this again. Again, looks like Einstein is looking at you, but in a little while, hopefully it'll convince you that you actually looked into the hollow part of the mask. This is now the forward-facing part of the mask. It looks real. Physical reality and your perception are in, in agreement. But now, boop, he seems to be facing forward. And that is weird, right? You know, it's, it's like the pepper. You knew it was just a pepper, uh, but you saw it as a face. So here you now know, because we talked about it several times, and you'll be able to convince yourself with a real hollow face mask in one of our booths. Um, you look at it, it'll look to you as if it was looking at you. Okay? If you have a three-dimensional model in your, in your head, and that is the way for you to interpret faces, this has to happen, right? The only way for you to see faces, you don't have a, ma you don't have a model for the hollow face. You only have the model for the real face. So it always that there has to be something coming out. That's why we think uh, this is working, why we have this uh, effect on, on you. OK. So I told you about the brain. Looks complicated from the outside. It definitely is complicated on the inside. It's organized at many different levels. One of them are the long-range connections I didn't talk about. But one way you can think about the brain is the most complicated natural object in the universe. Why? Because in most physical system, whatever happens locally has the biggest effect locally. In the brain, that's not the case. You know, just like an artificial system, like um, the landline system uh, that was referred to uh, this, this morning, an effect that's happening locally can have the biggest effect on something that's further away. I told you the space processing network, you know, it's like one area connected to another. The biggest effect of like one neuron and like one face area is on the other face areas, not on the regions in between that are nearby. So this is one of the reasons why it's complicated. Another one is that it's organized at these many different levels. We can map out the large-scale organization with fMRI and other techniques. I was referring to neurosurgery, uh, work from Wilder Penfield. Uh, this is a view on the brain where like, different functional properties have been mapped on it. Um, but this is by Nancy Kamersher, and she calls it the Swiss knife theory of the, of the brain, where the brain's power lies in having like all these different functions at different locations, having different modules for, for different functions. Not completely accepted, but it's like one way you can look at large parts of the brain, so with specialized functions. And face processing is one example of that. There are particular parts in your brain that are there for one purpose and one purpose only. You know, let's say this thing here, can opener to recognize faces. And that's what these parts are for, other parts of other things. We looked at this small scale organization, different cell types, something we don't completely understand wired together in these complex networks. And if you record from them, you can find very surprisingly meaningful representations of meaningful things outside. Meaningful representations, like these cells that take measurements of different facial parts, their face response if this is something meaningful in the outside world. It didn't have to happen that way. Again, after the discovery of face selective cells, it took decades to really fully convince people that they even exist. I hope that you are amongst those that are convinced. If not, I have two more hours to convince you. <laughs> OK, so these are wired together. This is the intimate organization into networks, right? With the large scale brain organization, local organization of cells. Something in between are these networks of modules wired together in which information is processed in a way that we can now begin to understand as computational systems. We are building them mostly with the interest to say, do we really fully understand how the system is working? If you build it and it behaves like the actual thing in the brain, then we think, yes, we understand how the actual thing in the brain works. OK, so coming back to Immanuel Kant, um, I've given you lots of facts. And I'm a little worried that I might have given you too many facts. OK, so what I don't want, you, want, want to happen to you is that your knowledge of facts will replace your wonder about the natural world. That's the most important thing. Maybe also the beauty. I find you know, this picture of the eye and then the photoreceptor, I find all of these things like, just like, very beautiful. Um, but also your sense of wonder. You know, like, how is it that you can know anything about the outside world at all? If we're getting answers, uh, that is helping us, but it shouldn't take away from the sense of wonder, because it is a wondrous thing like how we can know anything uh, about the world at all. OK, so my last uh, message is I recognize that most of the images of scientists that I show to you are pictures of white men. Not for a second should any of you believe that that's a reflection of anything beyond you know, how the history 
of Western science has evolved over the last 100 plus years or so. When I was getting into neuroscience, um, there was a sense, you know, that we know lots of different facts, but we haven't put the facts together into theories yet as they have been in physics. So one way this was put was that there hasn't been the Newton of neuroscience yet. And unfortunately, I have to report to you that 40 years later, the Newton of neuroscience uh, has not emerged yet. Or if he or she uh, has emerged, we haven't recognized this, this person for who they are, like providing like a basic theory of the brain. So that might be for you to do, okay? Like really synthesizing all the different pieces of knowledge into theories, a theory of the brain, like, uh, like how it's working. And my last point is, I mentioned Immanuel Kant, sorry, I showed him several times here before, is representative of Enlightenment philosophy. Several of the founding fathers of this nation were uh, proponents of the Enlightenment uh, philosophy as well. The reason why we have a republic is the belief that we are uh, reasonable beings, or we can be reasonable at times, and this is why we should govern ourselves. Uh, there's a fundamental belief here, um, and I don't think it's a coincidence uh, that several of the founding fathers were also scientists. As scientists, we should pursue the truth, and only the truth. We know from the time of COVID this can be contentious at times, but our job is to, um, uh, to pursue the truth where we find it. And that's what we should do. That's what we also what we should do as citizens uh, to keep this American experiment going. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'll be happy to take your questions. questions. Um, you'll get some microphones, so please wait to receive your microphone before. Um, okay, uh, and we'll, we'll start here. So we have a question here. In the Hubel and Weasel experiment, how come um, only the exo specifically would gather like the neuronic re reaction? Would any other symbol, if it started at the beginning, have the same effect? Oh, could you, could you say that again? Sorry, I didn't. When they were drawing the X's on the light beam, yeah. is it only the X's that get like the neurons firing, or if you draw like a triangle at the beginning? Oh, of the I'm X's sorry, I'm sorry. Same? Yeah, so so um, no, so um, this is a very courageous thing for them to do, okay? And like in principle, you don't want to do that. This is for illustration, but actually this is how it happened. They assumed that it didn't matter what they drew on the screen because the light would be overpowering that. That is just for them to put together like a picture of what they thought that the neuron was doing, and they just show these crosses and triangles. I can ask Torsten, he's still here, um, like why they chose these particular symbols. The pluses you can get, I think they do triangles because the other regions are not exactly the opposite of the pluses, but different, and so that might be the reason why they use triangles. I, ne I never wondered about that. But um, so, okay, so some of the things that are suboptimal for doing a good experiment there is you are assuming it's visual, so it shouldn't matter if you're talking to each other. But do you really know that? So, so you know, maybe don't talk. Um, then because it's like a handheld slide projector, you're adapting what you're doing now to the response of the neuron. So somehow there's a closed loop here between what you think is going on and what the next stimulus is that you're going to show with what the response is. So it's not a completely objective um, uh, experiment. And then there's the drawing on the screen. You definitely want to have like a wide screen not influencing uh, the stimulus and the later responses you're getting by what you just drew on, on that screen. I mean, they made sure that this is all okay, and this is a finding that's that this very well established. But since you brought up this, this this point that I wasn't even thinking about anymore, having seen this like so many times, this is, is really important, right? Um, so this is a deviation from how a, a clean experiment would look like. Cool. Okay. So why don't we grab someone from over here? Yeah. Here you go. Thank you. Um, is there an evolutionary benefit to being able to recognize faces and things that aren't actually faces, like the picture on the screen, or is that just a side effect of the cells trying to see faces? Yeah, great question. We think it's a side effect. Um, I cannot imagine why, you know, why it would be beneficial to, to see things there, but I, I can see reasons why you might want to tune your system such that it's more likely for you to see faces and things that are not faces than the opposite, to miss seeing a face out there. Right, because um, the main difference, okay, the, if you see a face, that is a live person who could do things. Outside of the technical world, like things that are inanimate normally don't do things. You know, it could be like a rock falling down. So there is definitely like potential danger also in things that are not alive or potential opportunities also. But most of them exist in the social world, right? So if, if you are detecting a face, 
that should bring you to high alert because things that would be more difficult for you to predict in the future might happen in short order. And so, so that's, that's why you would be, you know, um, uh, tailoring that way. There are also in examples in animals. Uh, so classical work in neuroethology that maybe uh, you're going to cover in classes. Um, Niklas Tinbergen uh, was analyzing how uh, birds are responding to their parents. And when he was uh, analyzing this in seagulls, there was a particular shape and color pattern of the beak of the parents that would elicit a certain behavior in their, uh, in the, in the hatchlings uh, to respond to the, to the beak. And then he would make an artificial beak, like the super beak, that would, they would never encounter in real life. That was, you know, just like these features, overly uh, strongly expressed. And then the, the, the birds would go for the super beak like all the time. And um, so, again, you can say it's like a weakness of evolution, you know, if like a super beak that would never give them food would come uh, along, they might, they might die. But in practice, it's not going to ever come along unless Nikos, Nikos Timberg is there, and that's not very likely to, uh, to happen. So, you know, you can evolve the system, you know, to just recognize the deviation from the norm. And the more different it is, the more you're going to respond to it. If that means you're going to respond to something else, even more vigorously that never occurs, that's okay. So we have a um, question all the way over at the end here. Yeah, yeah. Or one person over there. Um, so when it comes to the idea of conventional attraction, do you, you think that the facial features or types of feature fa facial features, such as like close together eyes, um, the neuron responds to the most are indicative of what the brain or the individual finds um, attractive? Oh, okay, great question. So, yeah, so at this slide with like all the different social qualities of, uh, of faces, including attractiveness, we don't think we have the code for attractiveness yet. So in this particular region, it's all about measuring the faces and trying to, um, trying to put them in a particular region of the face space as accurately as possible. So when I say as accurately as possible, um, also for this property, there's an exaggeration our human faces are extremely similar. And I just realized that actually in this study when I was taking measurements of actual human faces, just how similar they are. And you know, faces that look very different, they might just differ like in three, four, five percent of inter eye distance and things like this, but you're like so sensitive to that. By the way, so I think uh, it was mentioned in Eugene's introduction that the people who are face blind who cannot um, discriminate faces from each other, they have big problems in social life. People think they are, um, they're not interested in other people but they just have difficulty recognizing faces. It's not that uncommon. It's like 1% or more of the general population. My pet theory is that they are actually very accurate representing faces, and because faces are so similar, they're having difficulties, and that neurotypical brains are wired to overemphasize the differences. Just they're wired to overemphasize you know, the presence of a face, also wired to overemphasize the differences. But I think that attractiveness is happening in a different part of the brain. There's another, I didn't, um, I didn't show that to you. I showed you the six and then plus two uh, face regions in the temporal lobe in this part of your brain, but there are also some in the frontal lobe, and there's one I'm suspecting is responsible for attractiveness. And then we should find things that would correspond to behavior, you know, what this particular subject would find attractive. And there's, in humans, there's a big literature about, you know, what makes a face attractive with different, different components uh, contributing to that. But this is sort of a measurement, likely the basis for being able to do that, um, but not the place where, where, where that attractiveness computation is happening. So there, we're going to ping pong okay, good. from either side. Yeah. I have a question about Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a, an ability or an, a failure of facial recognition or something else, especially if it's a family member, so somebody you've known, but then you see them and you have Alzheimer's disease and you can't yeah. recognize them. Yes, so in Alzheimer's, uh, so it's a neurodegenerative disorder that's affecting lots of different functions. Just by the place in the brain where it's happening, it's affecting memory systems, ability to orient in space, and all of these things. Face recognition is surprisingly stable, but once it fails, and eventually it will fail, it's the most devastating. So yes, it's going to be difficult if you have someone who, who don't know where they are and can't orient themselves, they can get themselves in like deep trouble. But what happens in the social fabric of our lives when someone is not able to recognize a face anymore and is not able to recognize a loved one, that's almost like they've partially died. And that's why it's so, so devastating, right? If you cannot recognize your daughter anymore, or, or like, like another person, a part of your life is, is just 
you know, taken away from you. And then also from the loved ones who now know that they're not recognized anymore. So this fabric, the social fabric is destroyed. But if you look in, in normal people, but also in Alzheimer's, face recognition is a function that stays very stable. Like in aging, um, you know, you actually peak very relatively late in life, like in your uh, early 30s. And then it's like a very constant function uh, throughout life and only deteriorates uh, much later. Um, while other cognitive functions, you know, peak much earlier and then deteriorate faster. So for us, it's interesting, we're actually interested in looking um, into Alzheimer uh, models or, or general pathologies of this part of the brain where visual perception and social processing is meeting memory um, because that's like the place where Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders strike first um, in order to understand what, you know, what, what it's doing to it. But in general, face recognition, largely, be, I think, because we have this network of like, multiple regions at different locations, it has an intrinsic robustness. And so whatever function goes away in a particular way you know, can still be compensated by, by the rest of the network for, for a longer period of time. So yes, face recognition deficits will occur in Alzheimer's. It's not integral or specific symptoms of, of Alzheimer's. This side. No, middle. Yeah, middle. Hi, thank Hi. you for your presentation. My question also had to do with Alzheimer's disease, and I was wondering with neurogeneration and protein accumulations, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation how different regions of the brain corresponded to different stimulus of the body. So with uh, vascular pathologies that occur after the development of Alzheimer's disease, does that have to do with uh, protein accumulations and degeneration of the white matter in those regions of the brain, or is that a separate issue? So um, the quick answer, it all depends on like where it happens in the brain, right? So if uh, we go back to the, um, the Swiss army knife model of the brain here, right, like which functions will be affected will not depend so much on like how exactly it happens, whether it's the vasculature or deposits or whatever is happening, but where it's happening. Will it have any effect on your ability to move your body? Well, if it happens here, then yes, but that's not what normally happens. So this is why those parts or those functions are spared just by the spatial, uh, large-scale spatial uh, progression of the, uh, of the disorder. But if you have a stroke there, very much so, then that function is affected, or a lesion, then that function is affected. Um, let's pull, we have someone over here in the gray sweater. Thank you for the presentation today. Uh, you touched a little on a generative model computation. Yeah. Um, we are talking about brain and recognition. Yeah. Is there a way to differentiate uh, real versus fake? Uh, real versus fake? Because generative AI is now has oh, the ability okay, to okay. All generate right. faces. Okay. Um, okay. So, oops. Okay. So I showed you this model. So we think there's something generative inside of your brain. In fact, it might work to predict the incoming stimulus and then therefore make the representation more effective. So in that sense, there is a there's a relationship there, but I don't think that this internal model is necessarily helping us to tell real from fake. Um, it's a big problem uh, because um, the technology is not unlike this, and so um, and it will get better and better, and so it's going to get harder and harder. And I think it will ultimately be uh, a technical question if you can then still be able to if you're still able to program an algorithm that will be able to detect this was generated by. Um, by an artificial system versus it, it is real. Right now, it's still not perfect. You can see, see like the imperfections, you know, like an extra hand appearing somewhere or so on, and so, so you can tell, but that's eventually it's going to go away. However, I think it might only go away once the models use that, once, once they have a way to really simulate physical processes and then generate the image based on the physical process and not based on like large, um, uh, large unorganized uh, data sets that are, you know, just like patterns that have been overlearned. Um, but I think eventually we will fail, and I think we are failing right now. It's, it's, it's relatively easy uh, to make it. Right now, you know, the, it's still like smoother, so like artificial, but if you use like a smooth version of a wheel, stimulus is, it'll become like harder and harder. And um, I think this is a big problem. Like one of the things I talked about briefly is like how faces can manipulate us, right? And so if you now have, um, and how they affect our memory. If we see something that was artificial, even if we know it's artificial, we cannot really unsee it, right? We cannot also take away that we now memorize something from this image. This, is, this, this will influence our future actions. And so I think that that is a, is a big societal problem um, 
that, that we are faced with, and unfortunately, I don't think we are we are, we are wired to uh, to overcome that. We're going to have a question over here. Hi, uh, for Hi. the Jenkins experiment, wouldn't the changing focal length of the camera distort different facial features of the two people, creating disturbances? Yeah, so, so I didn't uh, mention all the possibilities in which, but yeah. So the photographer is sitting right behind you. He will tell you, yes, depending on what kind of lens he's using, how close he is to you, your face will appear at the same height and, and, and width. But the projective geometry is going to be different, and so your nose might look bigger when he's uh, taking the picture from, uh, from uh, closer and nearby, and other things are going to be uh, different. Um, those differences are usually subtle enough that they, that they don't massively interfere with your ability to recognize them, but it's like one source of variation that wouldn't occur like in, in natural life. Yeah. We're going to take point. two more questions. We have someone in the front, and then we'll, we'll get to a question over yeah, in this front. row. Let's do and it. then there'll be plenty of time to ask more questions for the a in the AMA, yeah. or AWA, I should say. Is the way we judge things based on the way we grew up or how we were born? Like if you see something attractive, it, do you think it's attractive because you saw it a lot when you were younger, or is it just the way your brain was made? Great question. So face recognition um, has both a very strong genetic component and a very strong experience-based component. The best demonstration of the experience-based one is, uh, in effect, caused the other race effect, is that you are much better discriminating faces of uh, the race that you saw growing up, if it was just like one, um, if you're growing up in New York City, that's not going to happen. Uh, but in many traditional societies, that is what would happen. It's like language learning. What happens in language learning is that um, at a very young age, you're able to perceive all different kinds of sounds and, and vowels. And then as you age and mature, your ability to discriminate certain um, vowels and sounds that you don't hear diminishes. So prime example is Swedish, has a lot of sounds that sound very similar to most um, speakers of other languages. But for Swedes, it's very easy then to discriminate them. The same in faces. And experiments have been done with monkeys raised only seeing humans. They cannot discriminate monkey faces anymore, but they can do human faces and vice versa. So it's not about your own race or your own species even, um, but about that experience. For attractiveness, I don't know. I think it's more complicated. And life and development is, is very complicated. And, and so it could be you know, unique experiences or you know, things that you observe. But definitely you know, like also um, uh, experiences with you know, like, um, the faces that you see and that you, that you don't see. But um, I, I think it, it's, it's more complicated and will partially be based on, on experience, uh, like perceptual experience, but also in interpersonal experiences. So we're going to take one more question over here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is there an association area that indicates irregularities in the face that results in the confusion when presented with mirror images or phenomena like uncanny valley? Yeah, so, um, okay, so this is a question inherently about similarity of faces and dissimilarity of faces. So the region, in fact, all the regions of, of this network that I showed to you, they will be computing similarities. Um, what we don't understand very well is at which point is similarity then close enough for you to say, yes, these are pictures of the same individual. Eventually, this must depend on your personal experience. And I know this because I'm the father of identical twins. And so for people who don't know that any of my daughters has an identical twin, they might very easily confuse her sister for her and vice versa, because they don't know that there's like another person that could look very, very similar to, to the first one, but it's like a different person. So your criterion to decide you know, at which point is that image you know, still part of my model of this particular person um, will depend on, on that social experience and that social knowledge. We also very lenient uh, perceptually to uh, be OK with even impossible um, physical features being lumped together into a representation of, of the same person. The best demonstration, a colleague of mine that he had like a, a face model that he would rotate as people were looking at it. And as it was rotating, it would change the identity from one identity that you saw in the profile slowly to a different identity in the front. And people normally don't recognize that. They're perfectly fine. Um, so this, this model that we have in our head that must have some you know, um, non-rigid uh, geometry to, uh, to account for that. They are fine then to lump like one identity and one orientation together with a forward view and another orientation. It's something that we really very much like to understand like how that happens in the, in the brain. So symmetry will be important. There's actually one part of the brain that I didn't show you that's exquisitely uh, selective for, for symmetry um, and others as well. But, but this 
um, this process, when do you decide that you know, two stimuli belong to the same person? That will very much depend on your personal experience. Now, the uncanny valley, some of you might know, others might not know. Um, it's an, it came up initially in, in computer animation as models of, of people got more detailed and more detailed. And you would think that as they become more detailed and more detailed, they become better and better, like more better replicas of, the, of reality. But it turned out that there is a certain point where they actually become creepy. And so, so they are, yes, they are alive, but they're also not alive. And that makes them creepy. So even though physically, if you take the measurement of the face now, this model is better than another one to mimic a particular identity because you have this sense of, of creepiness um, or unnaturalness or discrepancy you know, uh, between is it animate or not. And this is really very fundamental for us uh, to decide. That is what is called in this uncanny valley. It's uncanny, and so therefore you know, you know it's not, not the real thing that becomes uh, physically more similar. Um, I also don't know like, where that's happening and, and how, that is, how that is happening. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to announce for this. OK, so that's all the times that we have for questions for right now. Um, so let's thank Dr. Firewald again for a wonderful talk and thoughtful answers to the questions.